Yeah, so historic looking houses here. This is one of the most important medieval buildings in Europe. Originally built by the United Guild of Warwick uh, in the late 1300s and early 1400s. Welcome to the Lord Leicester. Leicester? Yeah. What's to do with uh, Robert Dudley? Oh, yeah, Robert Dudley. Oh, Dudley. Uh, Lord yeah. Leicester. Lord Leicester, rather, yeah. Yeah. Created a sanctuary for the brethren, ordinary military men who fought for monarch and country. There you go. Yeah, I've come into the cafe. The others are looking round uh, the building. We're just going to have something to eat in the cafe. Quite amazing building up here. We thought the menu was quite interesting here. We're talking about noonshine in here. It said that most ordinary Tudor men and women rose at dawn and by midday were hungry and toiling since daybreak. They would take a break to eat at what was known as noonshine, usually a Coffee. simple meal of bread and cheese. Yeah, so what they've got here is a fish noonshine, a rich man's noonshine, a classic Tudor noonshine. <laughs> farmer style noonshine and a king noonshine. It's quite interesting just reading the menu here. I oh, know, then they carry on, wouldn't they? Because uh, so yeah. they carry on until <laughs> later Until lunchtime. On. It also said Tudors ate a lot of meat, but rarely vegetables. The richer they were, the more, more meat they ate. Tudors uh, who ate plenty of vegetables did so because they had no choice, but were healthy because of it. So that's why we're having the poor man's <laughs> vegetable breakfast. <laughs> Giving us a little map. Ticket holders only, and a little thing, <laughs> a little sticker. So it's Guildhall. So blimey, that's a low beam, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. Oh, look at this. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the Lord Leicester Hospital, and it's hospital in the old sense of the word, as a refuge. Sorry? Hospitality, isn't it? Hospitality, yeah. Let's go in here. That's it. Oh, blimey, that's a big old door. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So this is the Guild Hall. Jenny's having trouble with the door. Uh -huh, That's it, you bet. This is what you see here today, not so different from medieval times. Apart from the music playing in the in the background. <laughs> the guild met round this table. So our merchants discussed business and trade around the table. bit about how the buildings were built. The mortis and tenon joint did that at woodwork. Henry VIII's reign, England changed forever. King abolished the monasteries and guilds and seized their lands and wealth. So it's thanks to the quick action of the guildmaster Thomas Oak and these guild buildings were saved from seizure by the crown before the king's stewards could arrive. Oaken shrewd, shrewdly passed ownership of the buildings to the burgesses of the newly created town corporation. It says the burgesses continued to run the town's affair on this site. And the municipal charter of 1845 was a legal basis for this transition. The United Guild of Warwick was dissolved in 1846. The guilds were common in most towns and cities from the late medieval period, where associations of townspeople bound together for mutual protection and self-interest ran local affairs, regulated trade and crafts, and provided support to members in times of need. Some were craftsmen's guilds, others merchants, but all had religious underpinnings. United Guild at Warwick was dominated by merchants and lawyers. Yeah, hence the scrolls and the giant book. Yeah. That's scary. Right, <laughs> yeah, so the Queen's Own Hussars Museum. The duck here. Okay, so a bit of a timeline here. Chapel was built in 1123, the first building of Lord Leicester. Lord Warwick's 
assets were seized. <laughs> Thomas Oakham, master of the United Guild of Warwick, negotiates with Henry VIII's commissioners to prevent the king from seizing the guild buildings. Oh yeah, because we've seen, we saw that, didn't we? Amy Robsart, first wife of Robert, Robert Dudley, fell down the stairs to her death. That was Kenilworth Castle, wasn't it? Kenilworth Castle, yeah. This is La Volta, the dance that shocked Tudor society. Whirling dance full of scandalous, beastly gestures and immodest movements. Dudley was the only suitor Elizabeth first seriously contemplated marrying. Hmm. Bare and ragged stuff is traditionally stated to be the work of Amy Robsart. It's by the munificence of a stranger enclosed in this present frame, the substance of which originally formed part of the interior of Kenilworth Castle. I don't know if you can see that really. Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, arrived in Warwick in 17, September 1571 to find a site for his hospital. Burgesses of Warwick accidentally or deliberately failed to greet him when he entered the town. The Black Book of Warwick describes Dudley's displeasure at being snubbed and the anxiety of the Burgesses for offending such an important person. Yeah, a little bit about uh, Robert Dudley's reputation is... Uh, his prominent position his close relationship with Queen Elizabeth made him the target of jealousy and gossip. Deed of incorporation. A wax seal. His signature. He died. Robert Bud Dudley died in 1588 of possibly malaria caught on the cam in the campaign in the Netherlands. Okay. Supported his hospital from his own income. Okay. 34 rules. Goodness me. Here in the chapel in the 1720s. Fifty-three tourists from all over the world began to arrive at the newly restored Lord Leicester. Vietnam War. World Wide Web is invented. <laughs> Terror attack on the Twin Towers. When Afghanistan ends. And capital works are opened by the Mayor of Warwick. They've got National Lottery Heritage Fund. For works restoration improvement project. Covid-19 and we're all sitting two metres apart. Yeah. On into the master's dining room. Yeah, that's where we've been up there. Oh, watch the step here, Jack. Master's dining room. And there was a film running upstairs, which uh, we didn't film. It's basically this is a hos hospital in the old sense of the word, where um, former servicemen can come and live, and they become brothers, don't they? That's right. 1981, Master Hugh Lee placed an advert in the paper for a brother. He conducted several interviews from his notes. We read that he asked applicants about their military career, families and hobbies, and judged whether they would get along with the existing community of military men. It was important that the applicants were in it for the right reasons. ...of masters who have lived in this house for over 450 years. Wow. 
The first master, Ralph Griffin, was master during the Elizabethan age, and I don't think things have changed very much since then. When Master Ralph took up this residence in this house, this dining room was over 200 years old. All the way from 1571, look at that. Quite incredible. Some of the visitors Hoover. Yeah. Well, the Civil War cannonball here. Yeah. Okay, so Brethren's Kitchen. Nurse or cook of the Lord Leicester used this laundry mangle to dry and flatten the bed linings after washing them. Early version of a box mangle from 791. 791? 791, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, little stories on here on the, on the laundry things. Thomas Higginbottom, so for 11 years in India with a 52nd Oxford light. Don't forget, walked thousands of miles and stayed in camel, camel and elephant sheds. I wrote this about this fascinating country in my life story. It took them six tries to get a place here. Perhaps it was because my 14 children were so grateful after years of service they found a home for me on Wallace Street with Betsy and our nine surviving children. Huh. It says beer was part of, daily part of the Brethren's diet. Monthly entries for the kitchen books for bulk beer buy-in. Beer for the kitchen was purchased at the cost of three to six shillings each month. Cook stove, made in 1854, cost £21, which is £1,700 in today's money. Uh, kitchen books. So in the 1800s, the master appointed a steward from amongst the brethren to administer the daily life of the hospital. It was a steward's job to keep track of money spent on everyday items such as firewood, beer and candles. <laughs> Recorded these in the kitchen books. Did you know he's the only veteran with a barrel of water in that town? Well, he seems to know something. It's like People admitted. a soldier all over the place. Fine man. Yeah, yeah. A pound of candles. A pound of candles, four letters from tax office. Mr. Chamblitz. Chimney swept, a new book. It's a John Bagger for mending the wheelbarrow. A bag of shavings. <laughs> new bowl for the kitchen. <laughs> mm. Importance of bookkeeping, eh? Well, it is, isn't it? She's got no idea how much she spent. Uh, no. <laughs> new mash stick. Yeah. One shilling and six pence. Six pence, yeah. <laughs> Keep, keep Jenny quiet for ages, yeah, that one. <laughs> Kitchen commons for the brethren of Lord Leicester. So over four centuries, the brethren have lived through wars, fought at sea, on land, and in the air, turned home to England to live a peaceful life at the Lord Leicester. They lived comfortably in this ancient home with the meals cooked for them in this kitchen and a small weekly sum of money paid to them by the Lord Leicester. In return, the brethren agreed to the 34 hospital rules and to participate in community life. These included guided tours of the Lord Leicester to interested visitors. Tudor rules were modernised in 1956, but over four centuries, the basic way of life of the brethren has not changed. watercolours in the 19th century. Wow, look at this here. This is an Elizabethan wardrobe taken from Kenilworth Castle. And fol folklore said that Elizabeth first gave the wardrobe to the brethren to hang and warm their robes in the kitchen. It's likely that the brethren did hang their robes here in the 1800s but hundreds of years later. Rather than still wear the Tudor style long wool robes that their pre predecessors wore. Hmm. Muskets. This is uh, muskets from the Chartist riots. Six flint lock muskets were sent to the brethren from the Tower of London to protect themselves against rioters. 
นะเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี
During the English Civil War in 1641, the garden was occupied by parliamentarian soldiers. Master Rice Jem complained of the bad behaviour of the soldiers and that they whoop, threatened to draw a bull, bullock, bulwark uh, all along the garden. <laughs> Let's have a look. Reed Thatched Summer House, mentioned in the diary of Nathaniel Hawthorne, American author who visited this garden many times in 1855. Always amazes me, you know, how many places we find. <laughs> you know, we've been to Warwick several times, we never knew about this place, and must have walked past it several times. You think? Must have done something. Yeah. Just, you know, a yeah. Built in 796, the underside of the gazebo is a Victorian storage shed. Huh. Greenhouse here. Stick the head in there. Oh, you can. Oh, it's nice and warm in here. Beautiful. All the plants, see. Yeah, it's not nice bit... warm in there. Yeah, it's all about with the different plants here, but obviously, Ooh, let's keep keep the door shut. Yeah. So just about 55 degrees in there. Very old this tree is. The Master's Garden. Viscountess de Lisle reopened this historic garden on the 5th day of May 1995. Water spout, obviously, at some stage. Yeah, that's, that's another garden here. This is this garden was designed by Geoffrey Smith and Susan Rhodes in 2000. Shrub planting mimics the patterns on the malt house. Between 1934 and 1955, the Lord Leicester bought its neighbouring buildings on the corner of the High Street and Brook Street and these buildings back onto the Knot Garden and include the Anchor Inn, a large 19th century timber framed double jetty structure called the Malt House. Uh, supposedly the Great Fire of Warwick in 1694 started when a man lit his torch in the hearth heath of the Anchor Inn as he was walking up the High Street. 
Uh, as he's walking up the high street, a southwesterly wind blew sparks from his torch onto a thatched roof opposite the hospital. Flames were carried by the wind towards the centre of the town. In less than five hours, over 250 families were homeless from the fire. But the Lord Leicester survived. And at the end of the knock garden is a modern bear and ragged staff sculpture designed and installed by artist Rachel Higgins. Mm -hmm.